following interview is being conducted with Elizabeth Penny for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It is taking place on May 6, 2019 at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time via conference call. The interviewer is Katie Watson, the France A. Cordova archivist. So Elizabeth, can you tell me a little bit about your early life? So like when and where were you born? Who were your parents? And do you have any siblings or anything like that? Yeah, um, I, I was born in uh, Buffalo, New York. Uh, my mother had grew up there and uh, my father joined her. And shortly after that, we moved down to Long Island it was, uh, you know, in dicey times in the stock market and everything, and jobs were very scarce. Okay. So they, they found a job on Long Island where her sister lived, and we moved down here and moved into various houses. Um, when I was six, I had a younger brother, and that's my one and only sibling. Oh, okay. Okay, um, and is he still around? Oh yeah, he lives out here too. Oh he great. He came out here long before I did, after he was in the Navy. Oh okay, and what was his name, or what is his name? Alan. Alan? Okay, and what From, were your parents' names? Pardon? What were your parents' names? Uh, my father was Fred Gump, and my mother was Isabel McNabb. Oh, okay. And were you close with your grandparents too? Were they also in Buffalo yes, when you were my, there? Yes, my mother died when I was about seven. Oh. Okay. And so my father's mother came and lived with us. And at that point, my brother was just a year and a half, so she had a, a job on her hands, but did a mm -hmm. wonderful job. Oh, that's great. And did she move down, so she moved with you to Long Island? Yes. Okay, great. She had been taking care of her brother in Chicago after her husband died. And he he was a bachelor doctor who'd never married. Okay. So he had all the women in his family taking care of him. Oh, that it's must be nice. nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did you, go, did you attend school in Buffalo or was that not until you moved to No, Maryland? no, no. We moved down when I was probably three or four years old. Oh, okay. Um, so you attended school in Long Island. Um, I did. And uh, we lived in Garden City, Long Island. And uh, my kids went to the same schools that I did. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. And some of the same teachers were still there. Oh, really? Did they remember yeah. you? Yeah, we had our 50th reunion. Oh, wow. And when was that? In, uh, I graduated in 41, so it must have been 91. Oh, okay. And what were, so what schools did you attend? So you went to grade school and high school. What were the uh -huh. names of the schools? Just Garden City High, yeah. Okay. Uh, what were your academic interests at the time? So in high school, like what were you, what classes Liberal were you arts interested in? Is, uh, oh, okay. Sort of a state requirement for regents subjects. Okay. Anything specific in liberal liberal arts? Yes. Okay. So what what specifically were you interested in the liberal arts? Well, I liked English, mm -hmm. and I liked math. Oh, okay. I was on the math team. Oh, wow. I was never able A to girl. do that. A girl. Were you the only one? Yes. Oh, wow. So how was that then? How did your peers, were your peers pretty accepting? Oh, yeah, it wasn't very dramatic, I mean. Math is not exactly a universal appeal. Mm -hmm. So then you've always been interested in math then? Yeah, that's how I got into statistics, really, was through
through the math. Yeah. All right. And so you must have been pretty academically savvy and talented because you got into Cornell University in Ithaca, New York uh, when you were 16, right? Uh, yes, just, just I turned 17 before long. Okay. So did so, you skip uh, a few grades? Pardon? Did you skip any grades? Yeah. <laughs> Second. Second year? So Second, grade school? Second grade. Second grade, okay. I learned my multiplication tables. Oh, so it was math that got you through? Yeah. Awesome. And at Cornell, what was your major? So what were you going through on? Uh, it would be a concentration in math, but uh, it wasn't really a major. Okay. Just took what came down the pike, yeah. Okay, so when you enrolled in Cornell, you just enrolled? You didn't have to specify an area? No, it was liberal arts, and you take you know, a little of this, a little of that. Okay. And I took was... calculus in the engineering school. Okay, at Cornell. So. And were you mostly focused on math, or did you take any electives or other types of courses? Any what? Any uh, like electives? I don't know if you had those at the time. So. No. Uh -uh. No. So all math. No. Yeah. Okay. English, history, Latin. Okay. Agricultural engineering. We had a, a little course up on the agri field for non-agri students. Oh, so interesting. We put on our zoot suits and learned how to take apart a sewing machine and an airplane engine. And oh, that's really change interesting. Change a tire practical things that women needed to know. Oh, that's really interesting. And so that was, did, was that open to anyone at Cornell? Yeah, that was for the liberal arts people. Oh, great. That sounds really useful. Yeah. And when you were at Cornell, um, did you finish your degree at Cornell before enrolling no, in the Curtis no, Wright? No, I, I left to go to Curtis Wright in the middle of my sophomore year. Okay. And so but I did not go back there as you had down. I went to Minnesota. Yes. Okay. And how did you find out about the Curtis Wright Cadet Program? Um, a friend I know was a, wanted to go and she didn't want to go by herself. So she asked me if I'd go with her. Oh, really? And uh, I said, to what? And she told me a little bit about it. And I said, well, Sure. So we interviewed with Miss Morrison. I've forgotten her first name. Was she at Cornell or was she part of the Curtis Wright Corporation? She was part of the Curtis Wright program and she came with us and lived in our dorm at Purdue. Oh, so was she a representative specifically of Purdue University? For the Curtis Wright program? No, I think she was a representative of Curtis Wright. Okay. So was it just a coincidence then that she also went with you to Purdue? Because there were seven universities, I think, that... Um... I think the people she interviewed, uh, she followed up. Oh, okay. All right. So you did you have a choice in what university you wanted to go to? Oh, yeah. Okay, so you chose Purdue. No, I didn't choose Purdue. You had a choice of where you wanted to work. And that nailed the university that fit into that workplace. Oh, okay. So what were the... So that's when I chose Louisville. Okay. And I should have gone down there to the university. But then I said, I told you, I was canceled due to the Spruce Goose. And therefore, they reassigned me to Columbus. Columbus, Ohio? Uh-huh. Okay. And so... So that's where I worked. Okay. And so when you were 
applying for the program, they would ask, they asked you where you wanted to end up working. So what factory? Right. right. And that dictated what university you would go to. Right. And there were, Ooh. what, five choices? Okay. Yeah. And we could not go to our own school, Cornell, uh, because we would be already too involved to do a proper job of starting out fresh, all of us together. Okay, so they didn't want you to have previous personal co connections or anything? Right. Okay, all right. right. And other than your friend telling you a bit about the program, did you know any, like what did you know about, what were you expecting from it? Did you know anything? I didn't know much of anything. We interviewed on Friday, and on Monday we had to say yes or no. Wow. That's a really quick turnaround. I called my father, and uh, he said, oh, that sounds wonderful. Oh, that's <laughs> we great. We were offered uh, uh, 40 hours, what, a week of classes, and $10 a week. Yep pay and all expenses and I had just transferred into home economics sophomore year okay uh, much to my disgust but it was a matter of finances that Cornell home ec is free tuition oh okay so you had to we had a financial crunch oh so you had had to tra transfer to home economics Right, so I was glad to get out of it. Oh, okay. Oh, so this was a really good move for you then. Right. That's great. Um, I was supposed to go to Smith, where my mother went, but we, could, we couldn't afford it. Oh, okay. And sorry, remind me where Smith is. Northampton, Massachusetts. Oh, okay, okay. That's one of the seven sisters. Okay. So, what were the requirements for getting into the Curtis Wright Cadet program? I had no idea. Oh, you didn't know? No. Oh, okay. Well, I answered some questions, but very casually, you know, I didn't know much about it. I didn't know if I was actually applying or not until they said, yes, I would be accepted if I wanted. Wow. So I said, tell me more. Yeah, sure, I'd like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's such a quick turnaround time, too. And that's a really big move. Yeah. Were you nervous at all? I don't know. Probably should have been, but I don't remember being. Okay. I was not seriously applying. That was the thing. Mm -hmm. So it was a bit of a surprise. Yeah. I guess you wouldn't have time to be nervous with that quick of a turnaround time, Friday to Monday. <laughs> well, I was just keeping my friend company, so yeah. that, was, that was it. And was this a friend, uh, when we had spoke earlier, you had a friend who also applied that was uh, right. very qualified but didn't get in. Is this the same friend? Correct. Okay. Uh, that must have been really disappointing for her. Do you know why? Well, um, it was. Yeah, because she, yeah, if she was more qualified, it would be a bit surprising for her. She was the only woman in architecture. Mm-hmm. And she was, you know, a brilliant uh, suit. Yeah. And do you... I have... imagine it was her religion that was the... Okay. And you... Curtis Wright had its preferences. Okay, and you had mentioned she was Jewish, right? Yeah. Okay. So when you found out you were accepted, were you excited at all? Yeah. Sounded like a great idea. And were you ex excited for the work or just to move to a new place? Well, the different, you know, educational setup that didn't put any demands on my family and uh, yeah. offered me uh, a job uh, when we got through the class, and you know, 
I thought it was fine. And after you finished the program, I had read somewhere that uh, Curtis Wright also offered to pay for women who entered this program to complete their engineering degrees. Was that part of the... I never heard anything about no. anything like that. Okay. I just, yeah, I read it in um, no. one article, so I, I was just double-checking to see if that was Actually, true. when we uh, went to University of Minnesota, um, they transferred credits for Jean Moorhead and me, and I got oh, a, a lot more credits on the transfer than she did. Okay. She had been further ahead in her studies at Minnesota, you know, where she came from. Okay. Than I had. So, uh, anyway, th that was a time when the uh, academics really didn't know what was coming down the pike when a program like this came along. And was Jean Moorhead in the Curtis Wright program as well? Yes. Okay. Oh, that's Jean. really... That's really weird. That... And I, I lived with her family uh, when I get, was up there, so I was a Minnesota resident by definition. Oh, okay. Huh, that's very interesting. And you took all the same courses, but you uh -huh. received yeah. more credits than she did. Right. Huh. So a different person evaluated them and researched different textbooks, maybe. I don't know. Oh, okay. But, uh, so there may not have been a real She went standard. ahead and, and finished her degree and uh, got a job with uh, 3M, uh, Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, and married the head of the chem lab where she worked. Oh, okay. So she did not go on into aero engineering. Okay, so after the program she switched careers. Yeah. Okay. Was that common with many of the cadets? Or the ones that you kept in contact I have with? no idea. Okay. We were a group of five at Purdue. Oh, really? Only five? From three of them from Minnesota, one from Arkansas, and me from Long Island. Okay. And we hung there, and we hung after we got out, and I went back several times to, after I graduated from Minnesota, to be with Jenny and her family and, uh, you know, was close to her as long as she lived. Okay. And sorry, she was living in Minnesota, so you both went on to Minnesota after um, the Curtis yeah, program. Yeah, okay. she grew up there. Okay. And so did Lucy Hansi and Suzanne Nelson. And they were all in the program as well? Yeah. Okay. And, and so... Ginger Branty was from Arkansas. Sorry, what, what name was that? Ginger? Ginger Branting. Branting. From Bauxite, Arkansas. Her family owned Bauxite. Bauxite? The metal, B A U X I T E. Bauxite. Bauxite. Okay. She went on into architecture, so she, she followed on something technical. The okay. rest of us did not. Oh, okay. Okay. And Lucy and Suzanne both got married. Uh, we married Sus Suzanne off in Columbus. Oh, for really? Her Navy man that she met there went off to see why we stood up with her in the church and got out of our house for a week so they could have a house to themselves. Oh, wow. Before he left. Mm -hmm. It was all very cozy. We rented a house together. Okay. A hundred dollars a month. That was twenty dollars a piece. That sounds wonderful. I wish my rent was that much. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. And so, when you were at Purdue, were there only five people in your cohort, or was this you were living with five people? No, there were a hundred people. Okay, but this was you each had individual groups that you stuck with. Yeah, we wherever we were assigned, we were assigned, but. Um, they all knew each other, and we gradually found them, so. Okay, so, so you got really close with those five yeah. or however many people that you right. 
you would stay with? Oh, we got to know most of them. And uh, did you know there was an RCA group doing roughly the same thing there? I did hear about that, and that was uh, radio communications, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have a lot of information on that program either. It was a matter of privacy. We weren't supposed to mess with them and vice versa. And we weren't meant to, you know, mess with the Purdue students either. We had a floor to ourselves. Okay. And that's so, where we were supposed to be. Okay. So you, people in the Curtis Wright Cadet program really stuck to just communicating and spending time with other people in the program? That's right. Okay. And then the RCA would have been similar. They in a different have, building. Yeah. Yeah, and they would have stuck together, but not necessarily mixed with the Curtis Wright cadets. Right. Okay. Okay. And was that really to keep you extra focused on what you were doing on your program? I don't know. Okay. I think it was just to keep from being distracted, yeah. Yeah, okay. Because it was quite a social life going on, too. Yeah, you had mentioned that when we talked earlier. So it was a pretty rigorous program, so like 40, 50 hours of coursework a week. Um, but you had mentioned that you still, you and some of the women you met through the program still went out and actually explored Lafayette and the surrounding area. What kind of things yeah. did you do? What kind and of... We went to the local, local churches and one of our five played the organ. We'd sing in the choir or so. That was a volunteer job that we did. Okay. Did you travel at all while you were in the program? Yeah, I had uh, a great uncle in Chicago, and Jeannie had uh, an aunt and uncle in Chicago, and we could go up on a Saturday afternoon and come down on Sunday afternoon. Oh, nice. And we did that to visit family, and we also went up one time just to go dancing. Oh, wow. And stayed up till dawn. <laughs> oh, wow. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, well, we had to get permission from Ms. Morrison to do that. Yeah, okay. You had to be a member in good standing before you could do that. Okay. And did you have to get permission from your parents as well? No, I don't remember even being in contact with them. Okay. See, my father was in uh, automobile sales, and uh, they were not making automobiles at that point, so he went to had to go to work for Grumman Aircraft on Long Island and took the cattle car out there. And, uh, okay. He came out once to Columbus at Christmas, I guess, one time. Oh, okay. And Jane's mother came at the same time, so. Oh, and we met nice. the neighbors, you know, in where we were. It was a residential neighborhood. It was a lovely, lovely house. And that was in Columbus where you were working, so this is after the program? Yes. Okay. And what residence hall were you staying in when you were at Purdue? I don't know. The one dead ahead when you walk down the long street towards it. Okay. Would it have been the women's residence hall? Yeah. Yeah. That okay. sounds right. When, um, so I think the program started in 1943. Uh, did you start in the winter? Yes. Okay, so it was like January or February? Yeah, I went home for Christmas from Cornell, and then I went back out uh, after the Christmas break. Okay. I trained to well, Indianapolis and then up to West Lafayette. Lafayette, yeah. Well, they were calling it Lafayette at that time. I oh. nearly didn't get off the train. Oh. <laughs> didn't like the pronunciation? Well, that's what they called it. So. Ah, okay. I haven't heard that, though I'm fairly new, so I could also be pronouncing it incorrectly. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, what were your first impressions of Purdue at the time? I imagine it would have been pretty snowy, being February. No, I don't remember snow. Oh, okay. And uh, next to the Cornell campus, it wasn't all that dramatic. Okay, so very similar? Smaller. Okay, so just a smaller campus. Yeah. But you had a nice student union, and uh, we had a snack bar down in the basement of our uh, residence hall. Oh, okay, that's nice. That was very nice. Was, uh, and so did otherwise you like... we were eating in the, their dining hall. Okay, so did you like the campus then? Yeah. Okay. It's really beautiful right now. It's spring, so everything's blooming. Yes, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And everything's bigger and brighter probably too and over time. Yeah, yeah. All the magnolias are really beautiful. Mm -hmm. So when you were living at the women's residence hall, were all the cadets, they were all living on one floor, right? Yes. And so then did you have rooms of like four or five people where you would stay with your kind of assigned group? No. Just two to a room. Two to a room? Yeah. And who was your roommate? Well, I had more than one, I guess. One was a sorority sister from Cornell, but we were really not great friends, so then I moved in with a different one. Okay. And she was a kleptomaniac. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's not good. <laughs> and she was in the program? Yeah, I guess she was a good student. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, that's okay. Uh, we survived all these things, but... Yeah, we supported, the five of us supported each other and wrote notes back and forth and planned outings, you know, so. Okay. And they had these uh, lounges on each floor where you could go to smoke or play bridge. Oh, you were allowed to smoke inside? Yeah. Oh, okay. Very different from nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> So, for this was the Curtis Wright program was it was aeronautical engineering compressed. So it was typically I think like a two and a half year program. It was condensed into ten months. So they said. Uh, uh, I know we had huge amounts of drafting, and that's where the bulk of the group went when they got to Columbus. Okay. So, um, drafting, like, layouts of planes or other aeronautical, yeah. okay. or sections of them. I don't know. I wasn't in that. Okay. So then you had, did the women in the program, like, when you were going through the program, choose what area of aeronautical engineering you wanted to work in? No. I was on an as-needed basis. Okay. Now, we were replacing guys that had gone into the service. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that was before they had some of these mechanical drafting machines. Okay. And so what would you have to do for drafting, like if that was your job? Draw some changes and sketches, I guess. Okay. But I said it was not my job. Yeah, so. and so what, what was your job then? Well, when we arrived, the group from Louisville, there were 15 of us, and they put us on the night shift and put us down on the floor doing some inspections on the planes for a few weeks. And then they got into placing us other places. But first they asked us, please don't wear blue jeans and plaid shirts. You're a bad <laughs> influence on the ladies on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> this was in Louisville? 
No, it's Columbus. Oh, in, at Columbus. In the plant, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, but I never got to Louisville. Oh, yes. Okay, sorry. And so while you were at Purdue, um, what kind of courses did you take for this program? Yeah, I don't know. Mechanics, physics, strength of materials, math. Drafting. Okay, so a wide variety. And were these all held in, um, do you remember where you took the classes, like the building? Does Hevelon make sense? Sorry, say that again? Is there a Hevelon Hall? Yes. Would that make sense? I think so. We had, a, had all our classes in the same building, I think. Okay. Okay. So that's where they had the, the lab for the strength of materials. The strength of materials? The big machines where you measured to destruct. Okay. See how much weight a unit could take before it crashed. Okay. And so you did all of this, these tests and the courses in this one building? As far as I know. I. From what you remember? Yeah. Okay. Did you have a favorite class? Who was... No. No? <laughs> I don't think so. Okay. And... so We you... had to bring slide rules with us when we came. That was the only thing we had to bring. Okay. So you had to bring your own slide rule? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and was there any, so you've touched on this a little bit, was there any practical training that was done in addition to classwork? What do you mean? So did you do any, so did you do, like did you simula simulate any of the work that you would be doing when you went on to working in the Curtis Wright factory? Well, I imagine the drafting was supposed to be. Okay. You know, sample of. And so you'd work on machinery and. Yeah. And you so stress tests as well. Get to learn to use them. Okay, great. And so Purdue already had all this equipment there then. Yes. Okay. Um, did you have? We made these little metal hammers. I still have mine. Oh really? What were and what were they for? I don't know. <laughs> They're about eight inches long, or you know, it's very small, okay. solid metal, and they had different kind of burl finishes on the various parts of it. Okay. Were they more of a memento, or were they? Act did you actually use them? We made them. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so as like kind of practice. Yeah. Oh, okay. Awesome. And did you have any? Just for an appreciation, I guess. Okay. Did you have any um, women teachers throughout the program? No. None? No. No, all men? Okay. And a couple of the men teachers were unhappy having women. They had never <laughs> taught really? women before. Okay. And they made it very clear they were unhappy? No, we just heard about it. Oh, really? Someone who was a big, heavy guy, I know, was in a panic about describing male and female parts. <laughs> <laughs> was that part of your program? It, in the machinery, yes. There were frequently male and female parts that had to be screwed together. Oh, yes. Okay. Just terminology in the metal field. Yeah, okay, yep. But he was embarrassed. He turned red. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, that's really funny. <laughs> yeah. And was it only that one teacher that you had problems with? Or that was... Oh, we little... didn't have problems with him. Okay, uh, just, that was a little... We just heard that uh, he was not looking forward to it. Oh, okay. But otherwise, were the teachers... The men teachers yeah, were... Yeah, we, we had them over to the dorm for dinner a couple of times. Oh, okay, that's good. I got to know them better. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. And who organized that? I don't know whether it was Ms. Morrison or the university. I have no idea. Okay. And did she stay with you the whole time? So with the cadets the whole time that they were at Purdue? As far as I know. Okay. She was responsible for us and keeping us in check. Okay. So she kind of was like um, monitoring the floor, like the residence floor, making sure everyone was keeping up with I the did, and She was the source of information. Okay. And permission if you wanted to do something okay. different. And she was employed by the Curtis Wright Company yes. Corporation. Okay. Did you um, did you ever meet Dr. Lillian Gilbreth while you were here at Purdue? Yeah, you said she talked at our commencement. I don't remember a commencement, but oh. she came one morning for breakfast. Oh, okay. And gave us a little chat about how wonderful it would be if we would follow on when we finished. Oh, that must have been really inspiring. She was she was yeah. a pretty amazing woman. Well, we all knew Cheaper by the Dozen, so. Oh, had the movie come out by that point? Well, or the book. Oh, the book, okay. And do you have any um, memories of any other faculty members that taught your classes? No, not really. Okay. It must have been a really busy program to be in. Well, it was. It was very time consuming. Yeah, 50 and hours a week, that's a lot of... Very full, full days, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, three days a week, I think we had three hours of drafting each day, so that accounted for nine of it right there. Okay. Do you remember anything else about your schedule for each week? No, we were just sheep to be herded. <laughs> just did what you were told? Absolutely. Okay, good. I bet the program was happy with that. And then we did what we could, you know, outside the restrictions. So, for fun. So like you were talking about going dancing in Chicago. Yeah, take the train up, it wasn't that far. Yeah, I think it's two or so hours, I think. So not I too far. Remember. That sounds right. Yeah, I'm planning on doing that soon, so. So did you interact with any other Curtis Wright Corporation staff, other than Miss Morrison? No. No? That was it? Until until you actually started? They were not the involved in the universities in any other way. Okay. Yeah. And before working at, so before working in Columbus, did you, was part of the program ever like visiting one of the factories or anything? No. No? Okay. Because they, I guess, Purdue's not near anyone. No, I guess. They were sending us to Columbus. I guess Louisville, by definition. Or, Louisville or Columbus would have been yeah. the closest ones. So we went home and then came back to Columbus. Mm hmm. So. When you're at Purdue, you're, well, the Curtis Wright cadets um, were kind of some of very few women that were on campus. And you were working in a field that's kind of typically reserved for men. I know you mentioned that you didn't interact too much with other students, but did you feel like you were treated any differently when you were on campus at Purdue? I don't remember that we were treated at all. We were just a separate unit. Completely separate. We were too busy to, to think about it. Then. Okay. We dated some of you know, the guys in the various Navy programs that were going through. Okay. 
and a couple of gals married uh, then or later. Okay. Probably more than that, but there's just this original group that I stayed in touch with for, you know, a long time. And those were the five that you mentioned earlier? Yeah. Okay. And Jenny went on to uh, have six kids and then go back to school and get a, a master's in, I don't know, it's environmental education. Anyway, okay. she taught over in, uh, across the border from where they lived in Wisconsin uh, for many a long year, uh, all the sciences. Okay. And she was teacher of the year for Wisconsin one year and went to Washington. Wow. So she was, was a very bright gal. Okay. And that is that Jeannie, the one that you lived in Minnesota with yes. and went Jean to the Moorhead. University of Minnesota. Okay. So I guess on campus, because you were pretty separate, um, did you experience, I guess you wouldn't have experienced too much the climate on campus for women? Were you no. treated very differently from the male students? No. Okay. Who noticed those things then? I don't know, but we'd uh, like, if you did, it would be great <laughs> for us to know firsthand. Well, everyone had a purpose. Mm -hmm. you know, there were not a lot of people dawdling around wondering what to do next. Yeah. But were there any rules that you experienced that were specifically for women instead of for men? I can't think what. Okay. I guess we had a curfew. Yeah, okay. And that was specifically for just female, like, women students? Well, it was at least for us. I don't know if it was for all women students. Okay. What was your curfew? Pardon? What was the curfew? What was the what? What was your curfew? Like what? So what was the time? So you had a curfew? You had to be in at a certain time? Oh. I don't. I just remember shooing the guys out. Oh, okay. But they were allowed to visit? Um, the residence hall that you were staying at? I don't think so. I don't remember they're coming in. Okay. You meet them outside. Oh, okay. Or maybe in the living room. Okay, so they could come into kind of like the main space. Yeah. Okay. So you were pretty busy. So did you have time for any other student activities while you were at Purdue? Well, I said we went to programs at the student union, dances, things like that. And I guess we went over to have snacks, probably sometimes. Made phone calls. It was very interesting trying to make phone calls. Okay. They, uh, you know, you'd make it and. Uh, they try to patch it through and call names whenever they got something. So did you have to wait around? Oh, yeah. Oh, so you just had to kind of wait there until oh, right. to see if they could make a connection? Yeah. And was that at the Memorial Union? Was that at the Union? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, that's really, that's really interesting. That was they tried going through one way and they couldn't do that, go through another. So were you, was this in one of the kind of like the main sitting areas in the union that you'd wait? I don't know, or if they had a PA system, I don't know, oh, okay. I don't remember. Okay. In those days, we didn't make long-distance calls casually. Yeah, I could imagine. And you mentioned that you went to some plays. 
and programs here. Do you have any memories of any of the ones that you attended? No. Not many. No, too far back? We weren't too, well, we weren't uh, too aware of the programs for the regular residents. You know, we didn't have a schedule. Okay. We were doing homework at night. Okay, so they didn't, you didn't get a lot of information about those extracurricular activities that you could Student do? activities, right. Mm -hmm. We didn't do anything cooperatively with the students. Okay. I think they resented us. Really? The other students? Uh-huh. Why do you think that? Well, I think they thought we were getting really special attention. Ah, uh, okay. And we were. Yeah. Well, it was important work. Yeah, I know that, but uh, that doesn't always make itself obvious. Uh-huh. So was, what gave you that impression? Like, did students kind of give you the cold shoulder? Sort of. They drop a snide remark occasionally. Really? I think we probably had the whole second floor. And they had the third. Okay. And I don't know many, how many floors there were. Okay. And so this was mostly women who were staying at the residence hall that would give these snide yeah. remarks? Okay. Regular students. Yeah, okay. And, of course, there were no Purdue students in the program. Yeah. Yeah. I guess they would have gone to a different university. Right. That was a no-no. Yeah. Okay. Did you think, do you think some of them had applied and not got in? And that's why they were a little bitter? I don't think so. Okay. They just didn't like the special treatment? Yeah. Did you Some feel? of them, maybe not many, I don't know. Okay. And I don't know how many left the program during the 10 month period either, some did. Mm hmm so not everyone stayed all the way through. Right. Did everyone in your group stay all the way through? So you said you, had, you were close with those five other women? Yes. Okay. So what are some of your favorite memories of your time in the program here at Purdue? At Purdue? Yeah. Uh, I liked practically any kind of meat, and I ate all those liver and lights, and a lot of the girls didn't, so I always had plenty to eat. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Was not that not the case at Cornell? Well, we weren't we weren't rationed there with I don't, I don't remember that. Okay. I know I waited tables freshman year. I, as far as I can remember, it was just a normal diet. Mhm. Mm But then uh, I had a friend that went to summer school up at uh, uh, north of Chicago. What's the college up there? At Evanston. Okay. Anyway, she was doing summer school there, and I went up to stay with her for one weekend. And uh, I got my ration book to take with me because otherwise you know, we couldn't get any food. So they hadn't torn out the stuff. So we went into a deli and pigged out with all the interesting <laughs> things we hadn't had for a while. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. It was a gal from, you know, from my hometown. Yeah, okay, and that was, at, while you were at Purdue, you went up and visit her, visited her in Evanston. Yeah. Oh, okay. North, yeah, it's a famous school. Okay. 
I'm not sure of the name. Okay. And do you have any other than kind of the feeling of some people resenting you? Do you have any other negative, do you have any negative memories of your time here? No, it was stimulating. You know, we were all in it together. Mm hmm So you really enjoyed the program? Yeah. And it sounds like it was right up your alley since you were yeah, was, had a strong interest world. in that. Yeah. And did you learn a lot of practical skills? Did you use them after your time working in the Curtis Wright factory? I, not really. Okay. The math parts, I guess, but mm -hmm. just, you know, good study habits. So after the program, did you earn a certification or just, as you were mentioning, credits for specific courses? Just transferred credits. Okay. Okay. Um, so your initial job assignment, which you've mentioned a bit, uh, was to work on the Spruce Goose, which was a wartime plane made entirely of wood. Um, so did you, you didn't go to, yeah, and this was, there. you never got there. So this was the project in Louisville, right? Yeah, it was canceled before we were expected. Okay, so the whole pro, that program was just canceled and then they right. switched you. Right. Okay. So then did they have extra people at Columbus since this program was canceled? Yeah, we were extra. Okay. They hadn't counted on us. Okay. And so they moved all of, so these 15 women who were going to yeah. work on this Bruce Goose were switched yeah. to Columbus, Ohio, the fact, the Curtis Wright factory there, and reassigned to what kind of roles did you do there? Well, that's where I got into quality control. Okay. And were you assigned to be in quality control, or did you have a choice on? Yeah, I was given a book to read by a guy from Bell Labs on quality control, and we had meetings. The the guy in the group with me, there were two other men from Columbus. Uh, the guy that was with me was a former milkman, and his boss was a former shoe salesman. Oh, okay. So everyone was new. So everyone was new. That would have been an interesting workplace. Yeah. <laughs> was that challenging then? Since. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was real work. Mm hmm. We were helping to get the planes out faster. Okay, so you were helping, so they were building planes at this factory, so the Curtis Wright factory in Ohio. And right. so your job in quality control, what exactly did that entail? Following up on errors found and finding, assigning responsibility for them. Okay, so did you do the inspections? Okay, so somebody else inspected the planes and then you would follow yeah, up? Yeah, I just got the information and figured who should uh, do something about it. Okay. And then followed through. And then uh, we started talking about uh, standard deviations and manufacturing efficiently by sampling as they came out instead of sampling every one 
they oh. just sample every so many, and if it was going off that much, they'd break down the machine and set it up again, and that annoyed them considerably. Okay, so, so you were... they didn't waste a lot of uh, of manufacturing things outside the you know, standard allowed. So I could just go down and look at their charts. Okay. Say, uh oh, this is headed the wrong way. Let's start over. Because you had cumulative uh, errors, you'd get a real error. Okay. okay. And that made less work for the quality control people that mic'd them up after they were uh, made. Okay. So you started looking at the planes or these charts? No, look, looking at the machines down on the floor. Okay, so you did quality control of the machines. Right. Okay, okay. That was separate program from the errors on the floor. Okay. So you didn't look at errors on the floor, just errors in the yeah. machines that they were using. And so since, so part of your position was to inspect other people's work, right? In that, in quality control? Yeah, and some of the grown men were not too happy about it. Okay. And I didn't wear a hairnet, and that annoyed them. <laughs> really? Did you, were you required to wear a hairnet? Yes. Why would you need to wear a hairnet in, um... So I and didn't the get caught in the machine. Okay. Were you working on the machines, though, or just um, inspecting? No. no, just looking at the charts that were hanging on the machine. Yeah, okay. And so what kind of, um, I guess you mentioned that a lot of uh, men who you were instructing to either redo or fix their work weren't happy about it. But they had to do it. They were told to do it, so. Yeah. But did you get any pushback? Well, I guess I did make the, make the choice about when it should be done. Mm-hmm. But they didn't really like that. Well, I don't blame them. No? Even if they'd done something wrong? Well, to take down the machine before they were taking down the machine when quality control mic'd up some stuff that had come off of that machine and found that it was getting to be too large an incremental uh, variation. By then, they had turned out a whole bunch of pieces and they realized, yeah, that makes sense that I should do it now. We wanted them to do it before it got to that stage where you produced a lot of uh, unusable stuff. Mm-hmm. That makes sense, though. Yeah. Right. Okay, but they didn't like that. Well, casually. Okay. I mean, I was young and female, so what the heck. Okay. I was forgiven things that might not be to an older woman. Okay, so you think they may have been a little nicer to you? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you think they treated you any differently because you were a woman? Probably. I mean, I think the, there was more respect for women in those days, not cooperation maybe, but... Uh, women were not pushing for equal rights and equal pay and all that. Okay. We thought we had it great. Okay. Oh, at one point, 
uh, some of us, not the five, me and I don't know, some others, uh, we took ballet for six months just for exercise. Oh, cool. <laughs> We'd get the cattle car down downtown and uh, have some supper and then do more ballet and then get home. <laughs> that was fun. That's awesome. And so the group of you that were, or a few of you that were working at the factory? Yeah. Oh, nice. Well, the others were too, but they, that did the appeal to them, I guess. Okay, so just a few of you. Yeah. And did all of you who were working at the Columbus factory, you said, did you all share that house that you mentioned earlier for? No, oh, just the five of us. Just five, okay. Yeah, yeah. this was a private residence, you know, oh. with what, three bedrooms? Okay. Three, four bedrooms, I guess. I don't know. Oh, and uh, one of them, Suzanne Nelson, uh, by then she was, she was married, uh, had a sister back in Minneapolis whose husband was in the Army, and she had three little children and no money to speak of. So she made us an offer we couldn't refuse. She came down with their kids and lived in our sort of attic space, I guess, and kept house for us. Oh, that sounds like a great deal. It was. So she earned her board and room by taking care of us. Oh, that's perfect, especially when you're working full days. Yeah. That's great. And they, um, they stayed stayed on with Suzanne after the plant closed and Suzanne went back to Curtis Wright and so did another gal that I knew there. Okay. Whether others did, I don't know, but not everybody went home right after. Okay. And so did the plant close or were just the cadets out? Well, that's what we understood. Okay, so the whole plant closed. Whether they closed and then reopened as something more modest, I have no idea. Okay. I left town, so. Yeah, okay. And how many cadets were working in the Columbus factory? Do you remember? Well, the best part of 100. They were all in the Columbus factory, so all 100 of them went to Columbus. Yeah. Wow, okay. Well, the 15 of us were in Purdue, but we were not supposed to go to Columbus. We were supposed to go to Louisville. So mm -hmm. instead of receiving 85, they received the whole full 100. Okay. And were the jobs typically supervisory, like your role? No, I think the great percentage of them were in drafting. Okay. If they had to make quick changes, they need a huge volume. And so those would be quick, quick changes to the plans of the planes. Yeah, I don't remember what the other Louisville people were doing, whether they went into drafting too or not. Okay. I don't know. So did you like working at the factory? Yeah. I remember <laughs> arriving in Columbus <clears throat> and going to is it the Deschler Wallen and calling the factory and George Saylor was our rep for Curtis Wright at the factory, I guess. And I say, so roughly, you know, well, I'm here. What do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> Did 
Did you have any orientation when you arrived or did you get thrown right into working? They just tried to place us, yeah. Okay. We had to find our own place to stay. They gave us some hints. Okay. Okay, so you just had to find your own accommodation, but when you yeah. got to the factory, you just started working right away. Right. Okay. So, after the after the war, so you said the plant, or from what you understand, the plant closed down. Right. And you returned to school, but you ended up going, transferring to the University of Minnesota. Yep. And was this, did you focus on bi biostatistics at the University of Minnesota? What they had a group called University College. Mm -hmm. And they would take credits from any program if it was reasonable and you could ask to take any program you like if you could get a couple of professors to sign off on it. So I had liberal arts and home ec and engineering. <laughs> and I got credit for all of them. <laughs> That's pretty lucky. That's a really creative degree. Right. <laughs> so uh, it didn't take long to get a, I said, you want a BA or a BS? I said, well, BS would be nice. Okay. So I got a BS with a concentration in math. And how long did that take you after starting at the University of Minnesota? Uh, one year and a, one summer course. Okay. Mm. Okay. And so you would have left the factory in 1945, right? I guess so, yeah. Okay, so that you would have graduated, what, 1947? I left in 45 in the summer, and I would have done, taken the full year into 46. Yeah, we've taken, in 47, yeah, I would have okay. taken one term. Okay. I know it was off season. <clears throat> we didn't even get to go up on stage. We just sat and stood and sat. Oh, so they didn't call you up on stage and hand you your oh. diploma? There were too many. Yeah. Everything was pretty informal about accreditation, so. Okay. And was that just the University of Minnesota, or was that kind of consistent across universities? Yes. So it was consistent across universities? Pardon? Was that just the University of Minnesota that was fairly informal? It was one branch. Okay. So science. I guess. Okay. I think Jeannie went through the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I think she heard that they'd only had 45 people graduate from that branch. Uh, they, I guess they just set it up for the odd ducks like us that had multiples. Okay. And so why did you choose the University of Minnesota? Was it so that you could stay with Jeannie and her family? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you became really close throughout the program. Right. That's lovely. The five of us, I mean, we did everything together. Mm -hmm. And so did you all stay in touch after leaving? Yeah, for quite a while. Okay. Jeannie did a lot of programs in the summer with Earthwatch, working with um, project faculty and helpers that needed more helpers all over the country and uh, all different kinds of programs. And she got Sus Susie and me to join her when we were 62. 
Oh, wow. Okay. So we had been in touch all that time, at mm -hmm. least. And so did you still see each other regularly after? So you would a have few seen times, her? times, yeah. Sorry? I was her maid of honor at her wedding. Wow. And did you see Susie and the other women as well? Did you have reunions or anything? Yeah, a, a few. To play bridge. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, we get together for lunch and bridge, but everyone had their own lives then. Mm -hmm. Again, I was staying with Jane, so. Yeah. So after the University of Minnesota, you graduated and um, you started a career as a biostatistician. Uh, where did you work after? Leaving the university, I went of right to the house. Well, no, <laughs> my home was about forty minutes from Manhattan mm -hmm. on Long Island, and I went in one day and went to three places that my statistics prop had suggested names of people in charge or hirers, and. I came home with a job as a research assistant, and uh, I was a, a demographer. I guess he could hire another person, <laughs> a poor student coming by that needed a place until they found something better. Oh, okay. So I worked there for a year, and then uh, <clears throat> I was looking for a, a place that needed a, a statistician. And I wrote Albany, where is the central part of the health department. And she said, well, don't write here. Write your own department. They've set up a position for a statistician. I said, oh, okay. So I did, and nobody else did. And so I got it. And was that? At about twice the salary I was getting in New York. Oh, wow. So I had the experience of commuting for a year, and that was enough. Yeah. <laughs> now, this one was only a mile from my home. Okay. So uh, I could go home and take care of the kids. Mm-hmm. And was that in Nassau County? Yes. Okay. It was at the edge of Garden City, actually. Okay. And what were, so where you were a research assistant, what was the name of that company? Uh, it's something Memorial Fund. Um, oh, okay. It was a nonprofit. Okay. Yeah. And so, when you're at Nassau County, what specifically did you do? Like, what did your job entail? Oh, things to do with birth and death certificates and. Uh, Finally, we got into automation from different kinds of punch cards, okay. and IBM cards, and I finally had a data processing unit with, I don't know, six gals entering the data, and then it turned into a, we had a mini processor right in the office. We came into the computer age. Okay. Uh, and it was difficult on management because the young folks with no particular background picked it up just fine. And management sort of thought if they had a computer on their desk, they could ask a question and get an answer. Oh, no. <laughs> and they didn't understand about this, uh, you know, you got to put it in to take it out. Yeah. <laughs> So that was interesting then. Okay. Get, getting, watch it grow from the very beginning. Mm hmm. Seeing the changes in a manual system to a more automated one. Yeah. And so were you, you were working with like birth, birth and death? Yeah. Records? So were you compiling? And abortions. And, okay. So and you, diseases. Okay. 
We worked with the epidemiologists in the early 50s. They had a huge polio epidemic that took over the county hospital. Oh, okay. It's dreadful. Yeah. So did you compile the statistics for that then? Quite a bit, yeah. Okay. How did you collect that information? Through activity sheets. And those were given out at hospitals or healthcare facilities? Yeah, they had to write up death certificates and birth certificates. And we'd code the deaths, you know, according to an international code. And we could summarize you know, what the history was of various diseases over time. Oh, okay. It was interesting. I enjoyed it. It sounds really interesting. And so is that where you worked until you retired? Well, yeah. I worked four years, I think. And then I got married and got pregnant and took off. 12 years to raise my three kids. Okay. Then I went back to the same place. Okay. At a later stage. How was that? Had a lot of things changed? That was nice. And then I was able to take a, one of the local universities to offer a master's in public in administration right on the health department campus. So I was able to take that with classes that were right after work closed. Okay. So that was the extent of my further education. And for that, so you went back for a master's, and then did you continue working at Nassau County in this, as a bio I worked right. I worked right straight through, yeah. Okay. It was just a one-year course, I think. Okay. And was it for kind of, was it more for you to kind of learn a little bit more? Or did you end up going for a promotion or oh, a different? A, well, that's why I became a biostatistician. I, got, I don't know. Oh, so you became a biostatistician. All I know is my, the, the, the gal who was my boss, hadn't heard about it, and her nose was quite out of joint that I'd gone ahead and registered and taken the course before she was able to start it herself. Oh, okay. And then when she, so when she did, uh, she wrote a, an excellent paper for the director of the department. Okay. And so before and after your master's in public administration, did you still, did you hold the same job or did you move to a new job? Yeah, I never stopped. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, and then when did and you? I retired when I was 58. Okay. My husband died and I moved down to Florida. Okay. With your kids? No, they were grown then and on their own, and my father had lost his wife, my stepmother, and I had a daughter down there, so I bought his house. Okay. Anyway, that was the end of my working life. Okay. Well, it sounds like a really interesting career path that you went on. Well, it was. Going yeah. from aeronautical engineering to becoming a biostatistician. Well, it's a fairly natural progression. Because of the focus on maths? Well, the quality control sense. Okay, so that was very similar to your position at Nassau? In, in a way. In a way. You needed measurements. You want to quantify things that are quality.
Okay. So is there anything from your personal life that we haven't touched on that you want to share? No, except uh, my brother has three boys and they match the ages of my three children and we have been keeping up with each other throughout their lives so that we have had regular family reunions. So I've had a, a rich personal life, I would say, too. Oh, that's great. So very close-knit family. Yeah, I've worked at it. And he's living, is he in Washington State now as well? Yeah, he's right up okay. in Seattle on Mercer Island. Oh, that would be beautiful. Yeah. Being right by the ocean. Mm-hmm. And so, what impact do you think the Curtis Wright Cadet Program had on your life? Probably a good deal. I would say, you know, it let me strike out for myself. And I think prior to that, the decisions had mostly been made by my father. So it gave you some independence? Yes. Great. So I've survived to 94 and running. <laughs> yeah. Very long life. It's great. Not many people can boast that. No, well, we have a number of people over 100, so. Oh, wow, okay. Mine is not a record. <laughs> not yet. No. All right. Is there anything else that you want to add? Or anything, yeah, anything that we didn't touch on today? I think we've covered your, your questions very well. Mm-hmm. Is there anything that I missed in my questions that you wanted to mention or include? I, I don't know. Um, I, I gave my son the pictures of the uh, machines. Yeah? And uh, see if he knew what any of them were. And I haven't heard back, but I sort of doubt it. Oh, okay, yeah. It was I just... think it was called, it was in probably the course called Strength of Materials, where oh. they, as I say, tested to destruct. Okay, to test how strong each type was. But I, I don't know. I don't okay. remember for sure. Yeah, I just thought... I didn't know any of the people in it. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, maybe it was, because um, there were... At least, there was at least one more cohort after. You were the first, I believe. I think there were two more, 44 and 45. Okay. Um, yeah, because you were the first in, one. In the book. Yeah. Yeah, we were the first. Okay. I thought we were the only. Oh, okay. So you didn't know that there were others after? No, and actually, I... I don't remember hearing where they went. Did they also go to Columbus later? I'd have to look into it, but I guess maybe they well, didn't. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You but that's why have... I never heard of it, because yeah. as far as I know, they didn't follow us. Yeah, because I guess you would have met them if they had come to Columbus. Right. So maybe they went somewhere else. Not my problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this was great. Thank you so much. Well, um, you're so very welcome. Uh, you make of it what you can. And uh, if you don't find that uh, permission, just send it along. Okay. Yep. For sure. Good. <laughs>